Let's uh, go ahead and open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 12 and then 1 Corinthians 14 a little bit. So this is our last Sunday of our current sermon series on the gifts of the Spirit. We're calling this series, What's in Your Toolbox? Because the amazing gifts of the Holy Spirit are wonderful tools. They empower us to do the work of ministry that we are all called to do. I, I hope that as I start this message, you didn't miss that. We are all called to do. These gifts empower us to do the work of ministry that we are all called to do. Yes, that includes you. Say, that means me. Yeah, you are called to do the work of ministry. And the gifts of the Spirit are critical in empowering you to do so. So far, we've looked at the gift of faith, discerning of spirits. Tom, by the way, Pastor Chris did an awesome job with that last week. I listened to that message while I was driving home from Florida. Actually, it was on Facebook, so the video was up too, you know, and I'm watching it and watching the road, and it was, uh, you really did a good job with that. Uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues, healing, miracles, and wisdom. Today, we're going to be looking at two more, the last two on that list uh, in the middle part of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. These are very powerful gifts, the gift of prophecy and words of knowledge. Prophecy and words of knowledge. Uh, these two gifts have been extremely powerful and impacting in my own life personally. So the title of the message this morning is Celebrating God's Gifts. These gifts, indeed all of the gifts, need to be celebrated. There's something to be celebrated. So how do we celebrate something? Well, according to the dictionary, uh, it says they gave three definitions. One way is to commemorate, I'm sorry, to observe or commemorate with ceremonies or festivities. So let's, let's get a little festive this morning. Another way is to make known publicly, to proclaim. And the third definition is to praise widely or to present to widespread and favorable public notice as through newspapers, books, and sermons. No, it doesn't say the sermons part. As, as for newspapers and books. So no matter what definition we want to go with, if we're going to celebrate something, it involves public acclaim, drawing attention to. And that's what we've been doing in this series. Uh, what we want to do today is draw attention to and proclaim the value, the attributes, the virtues of the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I think uh, sometimes we can be a little reluctant or shy about doing this because in, in calling attention to a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit, um, it, 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 it flows through a person. And so I think sometimes the check is, well, if I share an exciting story about the gifts of the Spirit flowing through me, it sounds like I'm trying to draw attention to myself. Or if we share a story like, oh, Joe did this or that, you know, and the Spirit really moved through him, like, oh, well, Joe will become puffed up or, you know, proud or whatever. And, you know, in Lancaster County, the ultimate sin is to be proud. You know, we can't be proud, not at all. But, but we can be prideful of our humility, but we can't be proud. So, um, so, so I think sometimes what that, that results in is that we don't um, celebrate the gifts the way we should. Sometimes when God does something amazing through a person, uh, and, and you know, it is a legitimate concern, but I think that in an attempt to be careful not to glorify a person, we too easily can fall into the trap of not rejoicing and or celebrating the amazing gifts that God has released. And again, usually through a person. So my first challenge for us this morning would, to, would be for us to be proactive and looking for expressions of the gifts of the Spirit within the body and then be purposeful about calling them out, about celebrating them, them and about affirming the one through whom the gift flowed. Because let's just face it, when we are putting ourselves in a vulnerable place, when we allow the gifts to flow through us, the supernatural gifts of the Spirit, it's a, t it's a tenuous place. It can be scary, right? Just for me. Yeah, it can be scary. It can be scary because we're allowing something supernatural to flow through us, and we're natural, and we're natural beings, but in the Spirit, we're supernatural beings as well. And so when we allow that supernatural to flow through us, it puts us in a, a place that can be intimidating. And so we need the affirmation 
so that we, so we have the confidence to move out in these gifts of the Spirit. It's important that the gifts of the Spirit are at work in each one of us, and they're celebrated so that we know the incredible value that we have as the Spirit flows through us to the body as a whole. In fact, we'll read that in this passage as we read it here in a minute. And so we should call out and rejoice over the gifts at work and thank God uh, and give Him glory uh, for what He's done. So this morning, uh, as I speak about the gift of prophecy and the word of knowledge, uh, by the way, that's also called a message of knowledge sometimes, word of knowledge, message of knowledge, same thing. Um, we want to, I want to give a lot of examples of those it's for the reasons I, I just stated. So again, start out by reading 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. We've heard this a lot in this series. And then we're also going to read verses 27 through 31. It says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given, why? For the common good for the edification of the body, for building up the body. That's why they're given. Verse 8, to one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge, that's the one we're talking about today, by means of the same Spirit, another faith, by the same Spirit, uh, to another the gifts of healing, by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, that's the other one we're looking at today. To, the, to another distinguishing between spirits, we looked at that last week. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. To still another the interpretation of tongues. Now jumping to verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church God has first of all appointed apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having the gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with the gift of administration, those speaking in different kind of tongues, are all apostles. Now we get into some um, uh, questions that Paul asks, some rhetorical questions. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work in miracles, do all have the gift of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? And the, 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 um, the um, unanswered a- answer to those rhetorical questions is no, uh, we don't all. But Paul says, but, then verse 31, here's the key verse, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. So yeah, we might not be moving all, moving out in all of these things, but he says, eagerly desire them, pursue them, the greater gifts. Now, Paul then, after this, uh, read what we just read, goes into the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he tells us that if all of these gifts aren't flowing out of a heart of love, there were only a, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, we're just making a lot of noise if these gifts are not an outflow of love for the Lord, love for God, and love for our fellow human being. So then we continue on from there to chapter 14, verse 1, Paul says this, follow the way of love eagerly desire spiritual gifts, there he said as it says it again, especially the gift of prophecy. Now, why this emphasis on prophecy? Looking back in chapter 12, Paul seems to place uh, a particular order of priority on these gifts. The Bible isn't absolutely definitive about an order of priority, but Paul does say in chapter uh, 12, verse 28, he says, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers. I mean, he seems to be putting an order of priority. Um, and, and so he then, of course, goes on in chapter 14 to say, especially that you would prophesy. So we know it's a very important uh, gift, spiritual gift, that, that we would prophesy. It's, it's very vitally important. Now, I want to talk about why that might be true. And first of all, let's define prophecy. Uh, when the Lord speaks a message through one person for the benefit of another, it's called prophecy. It's not actually that complicated. It's the Lord speaking through one person for the benefit of another. It's prophecy. Uh, When a prophetic word is given, it's for the purpose of knowing that God will speak directly to you. The Lord will reveal to you what the prophetic word is that's given, and it will be a personal message from heaven to you. And that's kind of a big deal. Of those who prophesy, the Bible says this, the one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. That's verse 3 there in chapter 14. In the Old Testament, prophecy was often given to bring judgment. And that's really because God's people in the Old Testament are so desperately in need of judgment. I'm actually reading through the book of Judges now as I'm reading through the chronological Bible, and I'm constantly amazed how 
God sends a judge to deliver them. And it always says, and then the people did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then he sent another judge to save them. And then it says, and then the, Lord, the people did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Like, seriously? How long do we keep repeating this stupid cycle? And so God sent prophets to declare judgment on his people. But in the New Testament, prophecy is typically were what, exactly what Paul just said in verse 3 for the strengthening, encouraging, and comforting of believers. Sometimes prophecy is foretelling a future event, while other times it is simply a word of encouragement for God's people. While New Testament prophecies uh, are typically words of encouragement and comfort, they can, may include a corrective or even instructive element that can be in there. We see numerous examples of the prophetic at work in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, we read in chapter 13 uh, that Antioch had certain, it says, had certain prophets and teachers. In uh, Acts chapter 21 and verse 9, we read that Philip had four unmarried daughters who were prophets, or you could say prophetesses. Also in the book of Acts, the prophet Agabus accurately warned of a coming famine uh, in Judea. And he also later warned the Apostle Paul not to return to Jerusalem. He said, if you do, you'll be handed over to the Gentiles. And uh, both of those prophecies turned out to be accurate. Paul went anyhow, and he was handed over to the Gentiles. So by the way, that's an important point. The, the, um, the word, the prophet, and when you get a prophecy, your job is to deliver the word. What that person does with that word, that's their responsibility before God. Paul heard Agabus' prophecy, but he went to Jerusalem anyhow. And whether that was, whether he was being completely obedient to what God was saying or not, I don't know. But he was convinced he was supposed to go anyhow. And he got thrown in prison and wrote all the prison epistles and everything. So whether or not um, he should have gone or not, God used it either way. And that, by the way, that's the good thing. That's the freeing thing about prophecies. Number one, when you give it, you don't have to worry about trying to force the other person to walk out whatever you thought you prophesied. And even if they miss it, or even if you've missed it, God's able to do a work with it anyhow. So it's so free. Just don't get all bound up with these things. That wasn't in my notes. Um, both messages in, in, in that Agabus had had a foretelling element. Many references to prophetic in the New Testament do not have a futuristic message. Uh, they seem to be the pur for the purpose, as I said before, of edifying the church. Acts chapter 15 and verse 32 says this, Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. That models how we see New Testament prophecy, strengthening and encouraging the brothers. Just what we read in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 3 that Paul says. Timothy received a spiritual gift through the prophetic message. It says when the elders laid hands on him and prayed for him. Paul uh, told Timothy to wage warfare with the prophetic words given to him. Listen to this, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. Timothy, my son. I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by following them, you may fight the good fight. That's the awesome thing about prophecy. It has the incredible ability to encourage us, bring confirmation to our spirits when we're feeling weak or defeated. Many prophecies are confirmations. Listen to this. Many prophecies are confirmations of what the Lord has already spoken into our hearts. Other times, they, uh, God, God may use prophecy to give us clear direction for our lives. Either way, prophecy must be in line with the Word of God, and our spirit must affirm it. When God is doing something new, typically, He will reveal it to His prophets, and through them, He can confirm it. And there's a, there a passage you hear many times from the Old Testament about this. It's in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. He, it says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing His plans to his servants, the prophets. So God has used uh, prophetic to bring confirmation of what he has done, what he's doing in my life personally many times. This has been huge in my life. Seldom has God initiated anything in my life through the prophetic, but he has done in incredible and miraculous fashion. What he has done in incredible and miraculous fashion is to confirm those things that he's already placed upon my heart, and it's been powerful. Many of you have heard my own personal story of my journey into um, 
uh, full-time vocational ministry. On that journey, the prophetic played an extremely critical uh, and vital role. Prior to my call to ministry, I had a long career working in the real estate business. I loved the business I was in. I expected to finish out my working days in that same field. I often imagined myself in a, later years in a semi-retired kind of state where I would stay active in the business, enjoying it even more as I slowed down my pace. However, God had other plans. It, it began as this strange and unexpected uh, restlessness, kind of a vague sense that God was calling me to something else. Over the months and years, it became a clearer call to ministry, but without any real clear direction. Then one day, God spoke very clearly to me that he was calling me to minister here at Dove Westgate Church. However, I had no indication that God had let anybody else in on that plan. And that would be a critical part of the equation. What I, you know, was, you know had I dreamed all this up? Was this all just a fantasy in my own mind? How, how could I confirm that this was really God's plan? Then suddenly, I received the prophetic confirmation. I was attending the Dove International Leadership Conference in Sandy Cove, Maryland. I signed up for the optional prophetic ministry that you can do in the afternoons. I walked into the, the room where this prophetic team was assembled, and it was from Dove Newport, the Newport Church right here in Elm, and included Alan Lucinda Dice. Many of you know that Lucinda has since passed away, and Alan is remarried. But I knew Alan and Lucinda very well since I was Lucinda's realtor for three real estate transactions, and Alan's for another one as, uh, since they had gotten married. In fact, I, I had very recently just completed the purchase of their new home in Elm. Lucinda knew that I owned, co-owned a real estate company. She had no reason to believe that I wanted to do anything else for the rest of my life. And as we began this prophetic time, it was amazing because part of the thing is you pray for a while, you wait, and you hear God, that the prophetic team does, and then they prophesy whatever they think God's saying. Well, she prayed maybe four or five words, and then she says, Daryl, God's calling you out of business. He's calling you into full-time vocational ministry. God is turning your heart towards ministry. And she just kept going on and on about this. I was completely astounded. The very last thing I expected was that coming out of that prophetic time. I was amazed that without, without her knowing a single thing that was going on inside of me, she would have the confidence, the boldness, the audacity to prophesy such a crazy thing over a businessman coming in there for ministry. I mean, I, I wait a minute, I owned a real estate company. I was doing all kinds of stuff in real estate. She starts saying, throw all that away. You're supposed to get into ministry. I mean, I'm likely to think she's lost her mind. But I didn't because it was an accurate prophetic word from the Lord. And it was extremely powerful in confirming what I was sensing in my heart. And it was a landmark moment in my life and one of the reasons I have such a high regard for prophetic ministry. By the way, what I did is I took the recording of that. It, it, this is a good point to be made. I took a recording of that prophetic word, and I took it and I said, Pastor Dwayne, I want to sit down with you. I want you to listen to this and just tell me what you're hearing or what you're sensing. And I got some confirmation from that time. And that's a, that's a really important thing. When we get a prophetic word before we go racing off with it somewhere, it's good to check it with a spiritual authority in your life a little bit. Uh, this uh, event started a tsunami of prophetic words over the next two or three years. It came rapid fire. Anytime Mem or I were in a ministry setting where prophetic words might come out, we could count on it that a prophecy would be coming our way. Guaranteed. It, it was a very tenuous time in our lives filled with uncertainty, but God in his love and grace was careful to confirm what he had placed on our hearts and what uh, through the prophetic and became very clear to me why Paul tells us to eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you would prophesy. God has such an awesome way of confirming what he is speaking into someone's life. I recall a number of years ago when Pastor Duane was still the senior pastor of this church, there was an altar call, an invitation given for people to respond to the front for prayer. Obviously, it was in the old auditorium. And we had perhaps 25 or 30, maybe even 35 people all across the front. And the invitation was that he was going to pray personally for each one of them. And so that's what he did. He went down the line praying for each one. 
and myself and another associate pastor were going along behind praying for them, but Dwayne was praying out loud. We were just silently supporting that in, in quiet prayer behind them. And we were probably 80% down, way down the line. And uh, as we got to this one, and I had, I had prayed over each person behind them while Dwayne was praying for them. And we got down near the end of the line, and uh, he's praying for this one person. Certainly, suddenly, um, I felt like God gave me a prophetic word for this person. And I'm like, well, I'm not, you know, this isn't my show. I'm not in charge here. I'm, you know, I, and I was processing what I should do with that prophetic word. And suddenly, Pastor Dwayne stopped. He says, somebody else have something for this person? You can't make this stuff up. You just can't make this stuff up. And I, and I said, yes, I do. And I shared what I felt like the Lord gave. And, and we finished out the line, and God didn't give me a word for any of the other people. One person out of those 30 people. What's that? Um, we'll get more into that in a minute. Hang on. Um, and so um, when, as I had this word... Uh, by the way, it was for Brenda Breckbill, is who it was for. And so you, I don't know if she remembers it, but I sure do. It was just, to me, so incredibly powerful that God would want to go to that extent that he would tell Pastor Dwayne and me the word that he wanted to share with Brenda. And it was a word of encouragement for her of what God was doing in her life at the time. Again, I don't, I don't remember anything. Many times when I have a prophetic word for people, I don't remember later what it was. Because it's not something I naturally thought up. It's something that was supernaturally imparted into my spirit. Now, there are many other examples that I could share this morning. But the point is that God desires to speak words of encouragement into his children's lives. His instruments to bring these messages are you and I, his hands and feet, his mouthpieces here on earth. Now, here's something I want you to get. Sharing prophetic words requires some audacity. It requires bold and courageous and obedient followers of God who are willing to step outside their comfort zones and into the obedient zone. And that, that's really critical. But that is how that happens, is when you are willing to be obedient. In fact, um, man, this message is going to go on long if I don't stop this. But uh, I just had this happen um, on our trip to Florida. I was having uh, lunch or dinner, whichever it's dinner, with the pastor from the church we visited down there. And we're sitting there, and my eyes, this is often how it happens if, if my attention is kind of unnaturally drawn to an individual in a public setting. And that's what happened in this scenario. And so I was, I was, we were sitting there, and I kept noticing this one worker, the employee, who was, it noticed, looked to me like he was doing a really good job, or really on top of things. And I, I felt like the Lord said I'm supposed to encourage this lady. And, uh, and, and so, but I didn't really have anything specific. And then Pastor Rebecca was sitting across from me, and she said, uh, she's talking about something else altogether, and I was a little distracted because I'm thinking about this person. And she's, she's talking about somebody, she said, uh, it just seemed like they were a seeker. And all of a sudden, I just felt like the Lord said, that woman's a seeker. And so I jumped up out of my chair, I said, hold on, I, I got to go share this. I walked over to this lady, and I, and I said, I, I just want you to know, I noticed that you're doing a really good job. And I, and I want to affirm you in that. I can see that you care about what you do. And I said, you know, there's this other thing. I said, I, I pray, and I, sometimes I think I hear God's voice. I hope this doesn't sound weird to you. But I felt like God might be saying that you are a seeker. It was a word of knowledge I had. That would, that would fall under the category of a word of knowledge. That, and and, and she's, uh, she's like, uh, so she starts telling me her story. And, in fact, she was a seeker. She had gone to a church in the previous town that she lived she came to this city, was not attending a church. She's kind of, she said, I'm just trying to find my way, were her exact words. And so I said, well, why don't you come meet this lady over here? And so I led her over, introduced her to Pastor Rebecca. We ended up praying for her, all because I was obedient to the word of knowledge that I felt like God gave me that she was a seeker. You could call it a prophetic word. You could call it a word of knowledge. It probably was more of a word of knowledge. So you might ask, how do I start to move in this gift? How do I start exercising this gift? Or, or, or how, do I, how do I know if, if I even have it? Well, here's the answer to that question. Start small. Start small, but start. I would say to these questions, you, you, you need to start small and start under loving accountability and oversight of someone who has the spiritual authority in your life. And by the way, check your fragile ego at the door. This is not about your ego. Uh, allow someone to speak into your life. 
By the way, in a small group is an awesome setting to do this within your small group. Uh, It's a great place to take your first fledging steps with a prophetic ministry. Allow your small group leader to share and see, you know, did that seem on target? Do you have any input for me on that? I vividly recall when I first discovered that I had a prophetic gift within me. Uh, It was many years ago. We had Dennis DeGrasse here as a speaker. And uh, we had Dennis here many times over the years. Uh, Dennis is well known as a prophetic minister up and down the East Coast. And Dennis, um, uh, by the way, Dennis has since passed away. And, uh, and so uh, Dennis was here, and he started sharing with us about the prophetic. And as he's sharing, um, he had us break down into groups of three. And he asked us to pray over each other, groups of three. And we prayed for each other just briefly. And he said, now, after you've prayed, just see if you feel like the Lord's impressed anything upon you. And uh, so as we did that, we prayed. I felt like the Lord had, in fact, given me a word for this other, uh, one of the other individuals. And so I shared that word. And, and, and in fact, after that service is over, that, that brother came to me and he said, boy, that really did speak into some things that I'm dealing with in my life. And all of a sudden, I realized, you know what? I might have some level of prophetic gifting in my life, something I never knew that I had all because I took a chance and and shared what I thought God might be saying. And so I continued to speak these words as time went on, and I grew in confidence in my ability to uh, hear God's voice and to speak his words to, uh, to other people. So here's what I want you to know. Many of you are just like me that Sunday morning many, many years ago who have a prophetic gifting lying dormant within you, that is yet to be fanned into flame. Paul told Timothy, fan into flame the gift that was been placed within you through the laying on of hands. I want you to, as you think about that, I want you to think about what Amos said. I read from Amos earlier, Amos chapter 7 and verse 14. Amos answered Amaziah. He said, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son. How many of you can say, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son? Okay, this applies to you. He said, but I was a shepherd. Uh, Here's the other thing you need to know. The shepherd was one of the lower occupations in Israel, considered one, actually one of probably the lowest occupation, not a high, and had high status. He said, but I was a shepherd. I also took care of the sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. This morning, Dove Westgate Church, there are those of you this morning that would say, I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son or daughter of a prophet, but the Lord, but the Lord's saying to you, go prophesy to my people. I declare over you, you have the ability to prophesy if you decide to step into it. If you're willing to step out of your comfort zone and allow God to infringe upon your comfort zone, I believe that you have that ability. When God speaks something prophetically into your life, he is speaking out and and, and unleashing your potential. God is supernatural. As Christians, I mentioned this earlier, we are supernatural beings, not in our natural flesh, but in our spirit as our spirit has come into alignment with the spirit of God. Here's what I want you to know. People, and you know this, people today are hungry for the supernatural. All you have to do is look at popular books and movies. Superheroes. What's your superpower? People love this stuff because we are wired as people. God made us, and he wired us to, deny, to desire the supernatural. He, he's placed this within us, yet the enemy then wants to take advantage of that, and, and, and he'll produce a counterfeit to try to draw, draw people away from God. And, of course, that's what the counterfeits are in popular culture that we see. But true prophetic words from God draw us closer to him. They're edifying or instructional words that God gives us so we can hear him, not only for ourselves, but also for others. Sometimes we can receive prophetic visions. Whatever way God chooses his desires to communicate with us, our God is a master communicator. Now I would note here that although our God is a master communicator, Some of his vessels may not be. 
Who are some of his vessels? <laughs> you and I, other Christians through whom God may choose to speak. So listen to me. When we're receiving a prophetic message from God, it is a good and edifying message that will bring life to us. However, we are receiving that message through a flawed human being. Therefore, it's possible that that good and perfect message that came from God is being flavored by the personalities, prejudices, or flaws of that human being through whom it's being delivered. I want you to think about this analogy. How many of you have ever drunk water from a garden hose? Probably just about everybody in the room has done that detestable, horrible thing of drinking water from a garden hose. Now, I want you to know when you drink that water through the garden hose, it takes on the flavor of the hose, particularly if that hose has been sitting in the sun for a while and you drink from it before you run all fresh water through, right? It tastes like a hose. Now, that water, when it went into the hose, it was perfectly pure. There was nothing wrong with the water. It was great. But by the time it gets to your mouth, it tastes just a little different. And the process of delivering that water to you, the hose flavors it. So it is with prophetic words. When they leave heaven, these prophetic words are pure, unadulterated, life-giving words from God. However, to get to you, they have to flow through the conduit of a human being. And in the process, they may get flavored a bit by that person's biases, their personality. And we shouldn't be put off with this. Really, we shouldn't. We need to sort through the prophetic words and receive the life that is there, lest um, we lose it entirely. I mean, just take the life-giving part and let the rest fall by the wayside, is what I'm saying. Now, in this line of thought, it's important to remember that all prophecy needs to be tested by Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Uh, it says this. Paul says, Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. And that's, what we, that's why we draw out these gifts of the Spirit. Don't stifle the Holy Spirit. Don't scoff at prophecies, he says. Another translation says, don't detest them or don't um, disregard them. But then it says, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Testing a prophecy means we don't just buy the whole thing hook, line, and sinker. Instead, we wait to see what God confirms in our spirit. As I alluded to earlier, it means we may need to go to a, a, a pastor or another trusted spiritual uh, Christian leader in our lives and ask them for input. Additionally, as I said, all Scripture must obviously be tested against Scripture. If it, uh, if it runs afoul of Scripture, we don't put any credence to it. Um, now, here's the other thing. The prophetic word could be right, but our timing might be off. That's another critical factor. We can easily misread an accurate prophetic word, making it mean what we would like it to say as opposed to what it's really saying. And God's seldom in a hurry. God is seldom, it's okay. A day is a, day is, is a thousand years to the Lord. It is okay to wait till God brings circumstances into alignment with the prophetic word that you believed you received. Uh, people get in more trouble than anything else by trying to make a prophetic word happen and trying to make it happen like as soon as possible. Many times we should do with a prophetic word as Mary did with a prophetic word she received from an angel. What did it say? Luke 2, 19. After the angel delivered the message, it says, Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. T too many times people feel it's their obligation to force this thing to happen as soon as possible. Many times what we should be doing is pondering them in our heart and allowing God to bring them in fruition. By the way, write them down. Keep recordings of them. Go back and read them and re-listen to them. I did that recently to a prophetic word I'd completely forgotten about. In fact, I remember one time a couple years ago, Hope uh, Tangert emailed me a prophetic word that I had recorded from years gone by that I'd sent to her years ago that I completely forgot about. Just getting an email to me by her reminded me of that thing like, oh, yeah, that was really good. I need to remember that. These things, we forget them. We need to write them down. And, and as Mary did, ponder them in our heart. If someone gives you a prophecy and tells you, well, I believe you're called to the mission field, 
don't quit your job, sell your house the next day unless God has spoken the same word into your heart and he's confirmed it by other means. Those means could be lots of things. His peace, uh, circumstances, other believers, those with spiritual authority in your life, his still small voice. I've seen people get into terrible problems by trying to run their lives based on what other people told them was a prophetic message from God. And if that prophetic message doesn't bear alignment in your heart, you often know it by the lack of peace in your spirit. Something might tell you something's just not quite right. Well, if, you're, if that's the, what you sense you're getting, then just put everything on hold. Write it down, ponder it, see if the Lord confirms it in some other way. Uh, lastly, let me just say that operating any spiritual gifts takes practice. Not many people begin prophesying perfectly. Paul said that those with the gift of prophecy should prophesy in proportion to their faith. Romans 12 and chapter, chapter 12 and verse 6. We, we, when we begin to prophesy, we grow and mature in it, but the important thing is that we begin. Now, when you feel the impression that you may have a prophetic word, I encourage you to ask these three questions. These are really good questions to ask. First of all, obviously, Lord, is this from you? That's a good one to start with. Lord, is this something you have given me to share with others, or is it just for me to pray more effectively? And then lastly, is it for now or for later? Uh, I've included words of knowledge, and I alluded to that in this message. A word of knowledge is a supernatural exposure of the mind of God regarding something in the past or present, typically in another person's life, which we would not otherwise naturally know. So it's a revelation of a fact that we would not have otherwise known. A number of years ago, the Holy Spirit revealed to me that a certain couple that I knew was going through a very difficult time. Now, I had absolutely no natural information or knowledge to believe this, but it was revealed to me by Holy Spirit. I worked with the wife of this couple, so one day in the office I asked her, so how you doing? She replied with a normal, oh, I'm fine, I'm doing great. And then I just stopped and I said, um, how are you really doing? And, and very quickly she shared their struggles. I was able to encourage her, pray for them, Uh, She later shared with me how much this encounter greatly encouraged her because it showed her that God was looking out for them. God revealed this to someone else. He actually revealed it to me through a dream is how it happened. But it only happened because I took a chance and made room for the Holy Spirit to work in this situation. Several years ago, I had a similar experience. I was traveling to New Hampshire for a backpacking trip with several friends, two friends, And the route took us through the state of New Jersey, very near New York City, right on the edge of New York City. And one of my hiking uh, partners requested a bathroom stop. So shortly we came upon a rest stop, pulled over for a a quick pit stop. Now, you need to know, uh, when I'm on a road trip, I have one goal in mind. How many of you know what that is? Arrive at the destination as soon as is humanly possible. So a rest stop is unwelcome. And it must be extremely short. I'll ask any of my family members. They know the drill. Three minutes max, we're back out on the road. So with this mindset, you just need to know that the context is king here. With this mindset, I'm marching into the bathroom of the rest stop, and you should see me when I'm on a mission. Don't get in my way. You know, I'm, I'm on, on a mission. And, but in, on my way in, my eyes are drawn to this man standing outside, presumably waiting on his wife, as we do, uh, to come out of the bathroom. That was funnier than most of you responded. <laughs> you didn't know that, but that was funny. So my eyes are drawn to this man, and he's got this T-shirt with a picture of a drum set and words that say, I destroy silence. So as I walked by, I sensed God say, I have a word for you to deliver to that man. My first, and remember, I'm in a hurry. I don't want to be talking to anybody. And uh, my first thought was, oh, great, God. And uh, what would that word be? Uh, Now, you need to know this man was culturally very different than me. Uh, This, we were in North Jersey, near New York City. This was a very large African-American man in North Jersey. There is no chance that he and I have anything in common. There is no chance that he wants to hear from this Lancaster County Hick farm boy. I mean, he's not going to want to hear what, this is what's going on in your mind, right? This is what you're thinking. But I asked the Lord, well, if I do get to talk to him, what's the the word? 
I felt like the Lord said, tell him that his hands are anointed to lead people into worship for me. But then there's this other voice in my natural mind that says, oh boy, this is going to be a train wreck. He's probably never been to a church in his life. However, I decided to be obedient. So, well, if he's still there when I walk out of the bathroom, uh, I'm going to approach him. When I walked out, he wasn't there anymore. Big sigh of relief. But also a little disappointment because I felt like I had this word for him. So I thought, well, if they see him in the parking lot, I'll still approach him. So as I'm headed towards my vehicle, I notice a pickup truck with Pennsylvania plates in the first spot I was going to have to walk by. Sure enough, here's this guy sitting in the truck with his window down. So I, as I'm walking up behind him, I notice that his license plate holder had a New York Giants logoed uh, license plate holder. He had a bumper sticker, New York Giants, and in the back window, he had a big logo, New York Giants. So I walked up to him and said, how you doing? He said, good. And I said, hey, uh, I noticed your Pennsylvania plates. I said, I'm from Pennsylvania as well, but I'm a bit concerned because if you're from Pennsylvania, what are all these New York Giants stickers doing on your truck? He laughed. He said, oh, so that's what this is all about. And I was laughing, thinking, no, that's not what this is all about. He told me he's a transit driver for, for the buses uh, somewhere north of Philly, and he's saying how the riders uh, on the, his bus are always busting on him big time uh, for being a Giants fan. And he used some colorful language, not vulgar, but colorful, and I thought, this guy isn't a believer. What I have to share with him isn't going to make any sense at all. Nevertheless, I plowed on. I made some small talk about the Giants, the new quarterback they signed. That was back when they had first signed Daniel Jones. And then I took the plunge. I said, I noticed your T-shirt earlier when I was walking to the bathroom. I said, do you play drums? He said, oh, yeah, I play drums and other instruments. Me and my family play all kinds of music, pop, blues, even country. He said, I got two amps in the back seat. I'm going to drive and up to meet with my family. We're going to do some jamming all weekend. So I kind of stuck my head in the truck. And his whole back seat's filled with amps and guitars, and you name it, all kinds of stuff. I said, so uh, would you ever play gospel music? He said, oh, yeah, maybe sometimes. You know, it didn't seem to be high on their priority list. Uh, but somewhat encouraged by that news, I said, well, listen, I hope this, does, this is my favorite line you'll notice. I said, listen, I hope this doesn't sound weird to you, but I'm a man who prays, and I feel like I hear God's voice sometimes. And earlier as I walked by and I saw your T-shirt, I felt like I heard God say this. I've anointed that man's hands to lead people into worship for me. And I just want you to know that there is an anointing on your hands to lead people into worship. And I want, you to, I want to encourage you to walk in that anointing and leverage the gift that God has placed in your life. And to my surprise, he said, that's awesome. Thank you. So I'm like, okay, this is going better than I thought. Uh, I said, well, could I pray for you? He said, yes. So I went to reach in the truck and lay my hand on his shoulder to pray for him. He's having none of that. He swings the door open, jumps out, and he puts his hands out. <laughs> okay. So I laid my hands on his hands, and I prayed for him. And as I finished, uh, you know, I prayed that God would anoint his hands, increase his favor, on and on. And when I finished, he said this, to something to this extent. He says, you have no idea how much this means to me. He said, this is huge. I'll remember this as long as I live. Let me give you a hug. So he gives me a big bear hug, says he, he asked my name. He said, I'm going to be praying for you. Meanwhile, his wife's walking out of the bathroom finally <laughs> to see her husband hugging this honky. She has this sheepish look on her face. What is going on here? And so I believe that I impacted this man's life in a very real and a powerful way. Who knows what the impact of that little encounter may have on his life, all the people he contacts, and, and all the people he may perform before. Uh, who knows that one little act of obedience, that one risk to look like a fool, to be ridiculed, that one risk that I took could have an impact on culture that reverberates for generations. Who knows? Who knows? All it took was a little sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, a little obedience, and a willingness to take a risk that I may look foolish, but I pretty much look foolish every day, so what's the big risk? <laughs> the last thing I had on my mind as I rushed into that bathroom at that rest stop was to look for a ministry opportunity, but God had one waiting anyway. 
The last thing I was thinking about when I was at a restaurant in Florida was, who can I minister to here? But God had an opportunity there if you're just sensitive and willing to take a risk. So let's celebrate the vital gifts of prophecy and words of knowledge. Let's seek them out. Let's make room for them and pray that God will release them in ever-increasing measure. It's 1110. We're over time. I was processing the idea of maybe having us try to exercise this a little bit here this morning. And what I was going to suggest is that we gather in groups of three like Dennis had us do and pray very briefly and see if God gives us a word. But since we're over time, I'm going to do it anyhow. Why don't we all stand? If you have to go, just go. I understand. If you have to go, just go. If you're a guest here and you say, dude, I didn't know I came into this. I didn't sign up for this deal. Just skip all this. You don't have to do any of this. But if you're not a guest here, I would encourage you to find two other people, maximum of four, no more than four. Two couples would be okay. But right now, find somebody. Get gathered together. Three people, preferably. Could be four, but preferably three. And I want you to just pray. Lord, give me something to share with this person. Give me something to share. And as you pray that very briefly, then go ahead and whatever God puts on your heart, share it with them. Just take a minute and pray, and then share any, anything you sense that God may be saying. Don't make it big spiritual thing, anything you sense. Go ahead and do it.